hello everyone welcome to as baba this is as baba's model answer for public administration 2020 paper 1 so go through the video we have discussed taking all the facts and figures quotes and concepts into consideration and your approach to the answer should be somewhere like this and coming to the approach you have to follow three lines of thought while answering the public administration question paper answers first thing is the demand of the question your answer should be strictly as per the demands of the question if there are four to five demands your demands should be such a way that they connect all these dots your answer should be such a way that you are connecting all the dots given in the question so mark the keywords prior to answering analyze them and provide those points which are hitting all the keywords at the first instance and as soon as you exhaust then you can compromise with one or two but none of your argument should compromise with all the demands given in the question one thing second thing is that specificity of the answer you are writing provide answer not a gs answer so make sure that you bring in quotes keywords concepts scholars thinkers and others and your line of thought will be restricted to administrative and institutional related arguments third is paper specificity well 80% of your answers will be from theoretical point of view in paper 1 make sure that at least 20% of yours will be from paper 2 as well and we are writing paper 2 20% of your answers will be from paper 1 paper compatibility and specificity balance it has to be maintained throughout the paper and with this three lens of thought if they are proper then no doubt you will hit the maximum marks so we have tried our level best to give in the best answers go through them if you have any queries you can get back to us so we'll begin we'll be fast here we are into friends first one one a the strength of public administration is in its exploration of complexities and complexities and nuances of public policy making and implementation here complexities and nuances of policy making and policy implementation how public administration is exploring all these four you have to argue on those lines and coming to introduction we can introduce with utter wolson's one of the definitions he has given many definition for public administration one of that is detailed and systematic application of the law so he concentrated on implementation part and we can explain him in introduction and coming to second one how to explore the complexities and nuances after introduction provide some brief explanation of the meaning of the question complexities and nuances of feasibility ethicality of policy formulation and implementation effectiveness estimated and the result of the law consumer satisfaction and all those things and the nuances wherein conflict of interest affordability versus exuberance prudence versus profligacy ethicality versus legality all those things has to be taken care in policy formulation and policy implementation and we can explain these nuances by using various quotes and definitions of scholars first one is the marshall e demock public administration involves problems powers techniques involved involved in policy formulation and implementation unlike woodrow wilson marshall e demock gave equal importance to both formulation and implementation of policies and he said here the nuances of problems the powers the authority of framing and implementing policy the techniques used to formulate and implement policies all these nuances have been explored in public administration that is how he has said it and we can use him best example it is from paper 2 we are bringing vaccination policy how efficacy versus emergency you are not having 100% efficient vaccines till now we are using 80 to 90% efficient vaccine that is how we have to strike a balance between efficacy and other emergency ecological nuances that is what public administration deals with 
then ld white delivery of a letter the sale of public land the negotiation of a treaty the award of compensation all these nuances are been taken care by public administration so here policy formulation policy implementation both come when we speak of delivering of letter sale of public land land acquisition act negotiation of treaty bilateral investment treaties all those things okay example land acquisition forest rights act development of tribal population anything you can give you the apt arguments then coming to fifner fifner quoted public administration as coordination of public and people's efforts in policy making and analysis the nuances of participation of the public and the ecological part of the public is also dealt in both policy formulation and implementation in public administration best example is how lok in lokpal civil society organizations they involved in formulation and they are also involving in the current implementation of the policies so we have given four to five arguments with examples and in the conclusion we can bring in nicolas henry who had given a broad spectrum of public administration and that is nicolas henry's broad ranging combination of theory and practice public administration is a broad ranging combination of theory and practice and here theory we can link it to policy formulation and practice for implementation so likewise we have answered all the demands of the question we have given quotes we have brought in arguments from paper 2 give and this can be one of the formidable answers as per our analogy so friends one more thing is that you cannot bring content from paper 2 in every question some question will be specific to the thinkers taylorism fayol folet here and all it is unworthy to bring in content from paper 2 maximum you can say that they are contemporarily relevant or they are relevant even today but if the question is not demanding contemporary relevance per se then it would be a waste of time and resource so open your all channels options and make sure that only when there is proper opportunity within the framework of the question you provide content from paper 2 else it is okay if you provide content from paper 1 and move on it is not like out of 19 questions you attend all the paper, all the questions should be having an answer from paper 1 and paper 2 there is no hard and fast rule strictly speaking no one knows here how upsc evaluates an answer so the thing is that go with the demand of the question don't fail to provide content from paper 2 wherever necessary and if there are no opportunities to give one then better skip content from paper 2 and move on with the specificity of the answer so we here we will see where and all we can give content from paper 2 we have given efficiently and wherever we couldn't we'll explain you coming to the next one 1b principles of analysis and principles of action were not differentiated in taylor's scientific management model here this question is specific to taylorism here we cannot bring in content from paper 2 so we let it go and we be specific to paper 1 answer so coming to the answer principles of analysis is those which demand thinking which demand analyzing a subject diagnosing a problem examining the causes factors and consequences of the problem such principles we can categorize as the principles of analysis then principles of action the principles that demand action that we have and we ought to do those actions so in brief in the introduction we can give what is principles of analysis that provide analysis of the conditions of the organization and providing solutions to them then principles of action that guide the action and execution of work at the floor of the factory that is practical and ground reality action on the ground and coming to taylorism yes almost all of his principles never differentiated between principles of analysis and principles of action some of his principles like science not and rule of thumb and not rule of thumb harmony not discord discipline and coordination mental revolution they have embedded both analysis and action that is how to analyze the 
conditions of the organization and how to bring in science and bringing in science both action and analysis are involved here harmony and discord so what is lacking in the harmony and how to bring in the harmony and how to shun the discord discipline and coordination these are merely didactical preachable principles which are which can be quoted for both analysis action ethicality business economy everything forget about analysis and action so not so much of demarcation is there you can explain likewise however in the critical part as the question is asked to comment we will balance it saying that though the principles of taylor were not differentiating between analysis and action but he actually differentiated between principles and actions that is his principles were morally related to analysis these science harmony discipline mental revolution these are analyzing part of taylor we have to analyze how science should be brought we have to analyze how harmony should be brought we have to analyze how discipline and coordination should be brought and what is action actions are not his principles but his techniques techniques like planning this brings in science standardization action related to science work study related to all these functional formanship how to bring in supervision so briefly we can reframe the argument given in the question that though principles of taylor did not differentiate between principles of analysis and principles of action actually his principles were specific to principles of analysis and his techniques were specific to principles of action and in the end you can defend taylor by quoting nicolas henry taylorism conquered the citadels of industrial practices with a tremendous effect of industrial management in the times to come this is the full quote i have cut it short so it is better to cut the quote short friends because writing the quote for half a page will not fetch you ma maximum marks you should bring how much is needed at at what time that's it so nicolas henry you can use more number of his quotes because he has written the commentary on whole of public administration and he has commented on maximum almost all the thinkers of public administration so you can use make best use of nicolas henry in introductions and conclusions then coming to 1c arbitrariness in the application of rule of law is a primary cause of poor governance discuss see this is a generalist question here we can bring in paper 2 so here you have to bring in that is how you judge on the spot and write it come to introduction the very intent of rule of law is to govern by rules not by arbitrariness so arbitrary in application of rule of law is not rule of law at all forget about application of law arbitrariness is itself not a rule of law so hence we can introduce saying that once we start administrating a state arbitrarily then rule of law goes for a toss as per evidence you can bring in evidence as well here i forgot to bring in so evidence is stated that rule of law is ruled by law not by not ruled by arbitrariness coming to the body karl marx you can bring in karl marx ideology and repressive use of law and he stated that rule of law is compliance to the rule of law and non compliance to rule of law is fate of law so karl marx fate of law you can bring in friends as we go on learning the new concepts it is better to take down them and revise them this fate of law is a very good concept in rule of law that is as we discussed earlier following the rule of law is rule of law and not following the rule of law is fate of the law so when arbitrariness in application of rule of law sets in it is fate of law not rule of law that is ruling the government a ruling a state in coming to some of the examples and scholars of arbitrariness in application of rule of law first thing rule of black versus rule of white 
can bring an example of George Floyd, a black man's death in U.S. recently, and the protest that triggered later. Then H. M. Sirvai, famous advocate and scholar of administrative law and rule of law in India, can bring his court. Arbitrary arrest of opposition leaders during emergency in India. He made a great study of an emergency and application of rule of law during emergency. So nothing rule of law. It is rule of the the then PM was. in action at those times and so we can bring emergencies example as well here then ununiform application of rule of law best example is free vaccine for one state and favored vaccine for others current government in one of the state elections it had declared of providing free vaccination in the manifesto so once again it is a violation of rule of law rule of equality equal protection of the law equitable equality of the law all those things the rule of rich versus rule of poor you can bring in example of european union on migrants how skilled professionals are being provided a carpet red carpet welcome however the illegal migrants are been shooed off at the shores itself you can bring in joseph stiglitz here how corporatism etc will have the rule of rich and rule of poor not rule of law how rule of law itself perpetuates inequality if we have rule of rich and rule of law then can conclude the body saying that arbitrariness is rule of the men the men who has discretion and who has authority to frame the law not the rule of the law of the land so rule of law is law of the land as a whole so that will be substituted by rule of the men who is holding the position and in the conclusion we can say marx quote once again a bill of a class cannot be made into a law of all this arbitrariness is a willing of a class willing of an authority willing of an elite group this cannot be applicable to the law which is complied by all so here we have brought in 3 to 4 scholars their codes concepts we have brought in 3 to 4 examples from paper 2 introduction conclusion moving to the next one 1d departments boards and commissions are as forms of organizations are dissimilar in the context of accountability and responsibility so the question is self structured we can segregate as departments accountability and responsibility how board is accountable and responsible how commission is accountable and responsible so our structure is divided into three sections we'll begin with the departmentation clause of gulikan darwick and all these boards and commissions come under departmentation is four p's okay purpose person place and product we can mention here purpose person place and product how we department on basis of these four reasons coming to first one department accountable to wings and ministries we can see how a department is made you go to any ministry there is a minister at the top there will be various wings and each wing will be having various departments and each department will be having field organizations and attached officers so this department this will be answerable to the wing and wing will be answerable to the ministry so that is how it works then absolute accountability so the department's day to day job is generalistic in nature that is passing of files updation approvals and all those things for all those day to day and every each and every work it is accountable to the under secretary the head of the department hod in corporate affairs or under secretary in government or even the deputy secretary the one who heads the wing and ultimately even to the secretary and ministry the department will be accountable 
so there will be four eternal eyes that will be viewing the performance of department day in and day out then mainly carry the managerial managerial work so responsible for all kinds of work going on inside the department that is department works like a chain so whatever work that is assigned to the department the department will be held accountable for any mishap in any part of the chain it is not like only one person all the persons and all the departments and whole government will be responsible if any bill goes mishap and protests trigger out in the street best example for departments human resource department public works department so any changes in the new education policy the whole hrd will be under siege and public works department will always be in siege whenever we travel and find that roads are improper then coming to boards boards are specialists per se unlike generalists of department they are not ias officers they are either engineering service officers revenue officers police officers or corporates or any of them responsible to only the job that is assigned to them so boards they actually work on a ad hoc basis and even if they are permanent there will be some work clear cut demarcated work assigned to them and they are accountable only for that job not for the day to day work and nothing like chain of jobs will be assigned to them so they need not worry about the day to day accountability only the result and performance of that project if it's done then board will be said to be a successful to some extent they are responsible only to the job that is assigned to them railway boards not responsible for ticketing related issues any delays any cancellation of the ticket IRCT will take care of that Rail railway board will not take care of that and we have seen whenever railway accidents are occurred railway ministry will be questioned and the railway board will not come to the limelight i'm coming to accountability on to only the secretary and higher ranks in the ministers so they need not be accountable to the under secretaries then joint secretaries and all of them secretary and above rank that is maximum only the minister and the government they are accountable to some extent the secretaries will also come under the rank and file or they are also accountable to the authority which they have appointed in case of private organizations not to anyone else so here examples like railway boards central board of secondary education the railway boards accountable only to the railway ministry railway minister or railway secretary then central board only to the education minister and education secretary likewise then coming to commissions it is very specialist in nature similar to the boards but the thing is that board is multi member body there is nothing one head in the board it is all are equal in that if if at all there is a head he is first among equals not the son among lesser moons but in commission there will be one man who is heading the committee and who answers to all the higher authorities which ever has appointed him or the commission and all other members of the commission will be accountable to this head so there are one two levels of hierarchies one within the commission accountability and extra commissional accountability so again a specialist wing and responsible only for the job assigned to them accountable all the members are accountable to the chairperson that is internal accountability and external accountability secretary and above rank as similar to the boards then example national commission for women ncsc ncst here you can see national commission for women need not report to ministry of women and child development minister of women and child development also they are they have a separate jurisdiction they work on the terms of reference given to them thus there is quite difference in accountability and responsibility of all these department boards and commissions and we have rendered it to the best possible capacity and in the conclusion we can say that the difference lies in whether they are a specialist or generalist whether they are head of or permanent whether they are the line of staff agents 
or whether there is a difference in the rank, rank and file. This is the rank, this is the file. See, under secretary, clerk, joint secretary, secretary, minister, and here section officers, and this is the rank, that is top to bottom hierarchy, education ministry, health ministry, defense ministry, this is the file. So that is how the administration goes on. So you should be knowing the clear cut meaning of every concepts in order to write up a bad answer. That is how you gain the command in the subject. Coming to next one, one E. Administrative man bridges the psychological man and rational man. Explain. Here there are three concepts. One is psychological man, rational man and administrative man. And our job is to connect administrative man to both the things. Coming to Simon, we will introduce administrative man first. Simon's administrative man, that is efficiency, effectiveness, along with emotions and social mores, societal mores. That is administrative man takes into care both values and science, facts. So the value fact dichotomy will be less visible as well as as far as administrative man is concerned. Then. We'll explain the rational man first, how facts-based decision he will be profit motive in case of private organizations, treating workers as a cogs in the machine, the theory works, theory X, cosmology of Douglas McGregor, all these things are the characteristics of a rational man. And what are the characteristics of psychological man? Psychological man, only the order of situation. So nothing else, even if the workers are laggard, indolent, gullible, no orders will come unless the situation demands. And he treats them as a theory why cosmology of Douglas McGregor that is utmost respect and reverence and treating them as a building blocks of the organization. Treating them as challenge seekers, regarding them as brilliant, clever people who, are, who like to work, who have interest in their works, who have long-term perspectives, who bring up creative ideas, innovations, and all those things. Now, how to strike a balance? Here we can bring in functions of executive of Chester Bernard, where he explains the functions of an executive has to bring in harmony, discipline, scalar chain, almost all the things of classical, and also communication, commonality, and acceptance. So the function of executive is not just communication, commonality and acceptance, it is harmony, discipline and scalar chain. So here in comes the administrative man who takes up both the things. Actually, just a Bernard didn't give the explanation for administrative man, but it is no fault to bring in just a Bernard here and explain his psychological things and his usage of function of executive. Then coming to bounded rationality, coming to back to Simon. Bounded rationality, how when there is a conflict of interest between value and fact, and whenever the rationality is bound, we go to the satisfying decisions. So we have to be within the framework of Simon's value fact dichotomy. Bounded rationality, bounded rationality, satisfying decisions, information, overloading cognitive impediments and all those things here. And after explaining the administrative man, how he balances both psychological and emotional, we can bring in examples like patent versus mass distribution of vaccines, where an administrative man, he strikes a balance between whether to award patents to the or corporates who invented the vaccine or whether to avoid patent and use it for mass distribution and how a satisfying decision is made it is made by having a nominal price for the PDS ration that is even in the vaccine we can have a nominal price without awarding patent to anyone it is exuberant rate and few participants to normal nominal rate and huge participation. The such satisfying decision we have made in PDS rations 
wherein actually going to the economic point of view we have to provide it at the retail maximum retail price or even minimum retail price will suffice but we are providing at the price below even the minimum retail that is the highly subsidized rates but however we are charging to some extent so that is how satisfying decisions are made so not that difficult a question but the thing is that how to bring in various scholars and thinkers will rule the roost here rule the roost here and coming to man he is not a rational animal he is a psychosociological animal his overriding needs is to belong and bring in mayo and at that same time we can critic mayo saying that even classical theories are also important for administration to bring in discipline order economic prudence and all those things so this is this answer is basically a mean of both classical and behavioralism so whatever mean we find it out that will suffice for this coming to next one 2a the movement towards governance as an organizing concept of public administration and management is because the focus of administration has been shifting from bureaucratic state to hollow state and third party governance critically examine friends we have seen a trend in upsc that some unfamiliar technical terms will be brought into and students get confused with that and they try to choose those questions which are not having such terms however we have found a way to tackle such question that is whenever upsc provides such questions the meaning of the question itself embeds the meaning of the topic here the question says shifting from bureaucratic state to hollow state and third party government what is a hollow state hollow state is itself a third party government the very meaning of hollow state is to contract out the work of bureaucracy to third parties so if you have confusion in the keyword you understand the overall meaning of the question and move ahead and provide the best explanation to the overall demand of the question that will be more than sufficient to hit the bulls eye as we said we have introduced the question with the meaning itself follow state is nothing but third party governance where most of the government projects are contracted out okay and coming to the overall question movement towards governance as organizing concept of public administration and management is focus of administration as shifting from bureaucratic state to hollow state that is when the hollow state is replacing bureaucracy we have to organize and manage the things so we are moving towards a network governance where we have to balance that's it we have to become regulator and facilitator rather than provider of goods and services or the sole formulator of law or the hegemony in the market how how we are moving from moving towards administration and management yes market decision making we are moving towards a network governance as we move towards a hollow state then when private sectors enter in we have to slow down the bureaucracy we should not be the provider of goods and services we can begin gutres slow down bureaucracy here how privatization of psus then public goods and services they are being slowed down and private goods and services are encouraged then serving to steering can bring in npm as well here yes. here here how general and cooper they recommend for facilitatory role of the government best example competition commission of india rather than mrtp act then coming to warner jones activating state how we have to motivate we have to activate we have to act as a catalyst between ngos and civil societies to take part in governance and also in case of joint ventures public private partnerships how we manage how we sign the concessional treaty we provide freedom to the private at the same time monitor them 
in the joint ventures how we have a share holding in the project so that project will be under our specificities and choices so thus when we are contracting out we are moving as management here management is network governance is management then slowed down bureaucracy is moving towards management then facilitatory role is management then you are motivating and encouraging to take part participatory governance is also management so in all this we have arguing that while well, government is moving from bureaucracy to hollow state we are moving towards organizing and managerial roles the question has to critically examine we have to say that no it is not the hollow state which is bringing in managerialism but it is something else so in the critic part as this is a large question you critic every part of the question every demand of the question you criticize or you provide a negative point here that will suffice first thing goldsmith and eggers privatization gives more than less responsibility for the government here we are criti critiking the managerial role we are saying that even in the hall of state government is the my bop its role is not reduced rather than moving to the organized and managerial state even in the contracting out we are in the hegemonical state then organizing role restricted to areas where private is present else government is largely governance is largely government led then even before contracting out governance had a managerial role now we are critiquing the onset of hollow state no even before that we had a managerial role there is nothing like once the hollow state sets in we are moving towards the back end administration of government coordination between ministries and departments they are managerial roles itself so there is no need of a hollow state to set in in order to for the bureaucracy to move towards organizing and managerialism the very meaning of governance is to choose or manage or organize so the very bureaucracy are the manage bureaucrats are the managers the bureaucracy is to manage the things to do the day to day administration once again there is nothing like we are moving towards managerialism with the hollow state we have already moved long back at the onset of bureaucracy so we have criticized the managerial role of the government at one part the concept of hollow state at the other part and the very concept of bureaucracy and managerialism in the third part so if you have any other lines of argument where you can negate this statement you can criticize them nothing like you have to follow only these lines of argument this is only one line of thought process then we have conclusion we can conclude with the world bank's definition of good governance this proper proper utilization of resources for development so any kind of work can be brought under governance managerialism to my bop provider of goods and services regulator of private all those things can be brought under governance so bureaucracy is both a hegemonical and a hollow state it is first party second party third party fourth party all parties of governance is embedded in bureaucracy likewise we can conclude coming to next one organizing organizations of the future will be organic adaptive structures but temporary systems discuss how varun banis characterizes the new forms form of organization this is a bit new concept so we have to study varun banis in detail in order to answer this question anyway we have provided the answer for you firstly varun banis concept of changing organizations he said that organizations are not permanent at all they keep on changing every organization has its own paradigm maybe a paradigm of success paradigm of failure its own phases
so how organization we can say how our organization changes in spite of gestalt in spite of negentropy in spite of cybernetics the cybernetics which we have adopted in order to make organization a stable and permanent one but in future they will be changing so we have seen that in spite of all these things we had to bring in homeostasis in case of ecological organization which are amenable to the shocks of economy and ecology and environment then renzis lekard came up with a if then model in case of ecological organization so overall we can say that organizations in the future are going to be more affected by ecology so there will be temp temporariness and non ephemerality even in case of adaptive and systemic organizations so they are temporary and changing because as per warren benis after discussing a bit of systemic theory we come to warren benis warren benis says that in the leadership after some time of growth of an organizations leaders slowly start becoming managers that is instead of motivating they start just looking on the day to day administration they lose out their creativity they lose out that morale and personality of which they are being accepted as leaders and they start maintaining status quo and thus after this complacency sets in among the leaders there will be some tendency is to take over the leader among the workers so they feel dejected and they feel that okay it's time to change the leadership and after this after reaching a threshold of dejection and this can result in change in the leadership and thus the organization changes from one phase to other so that is how in spite of cybernetics in spite of gestalt in spite of even homeostasis the organizations of future will be bound to be temporary they will be bound to change because from the very inner leadership the change comes from the very inner organization the change occurs there not be a need of any environment or ecological shocks the change comes from the very organization itself then one more concept warren benis stated was adocracy though this was a word coined by warren benis himself the bureaucracy in the organization tend to be adocracy in future then what is adocracy that is any one person takes the leadership in one particular situation and gives it to other in case of other situation for example if there is a pandemic health minister becomes the prime minister if there is economic lockdown economic minister of economic affairs becomes the prime minister likewise there is no one leadership the leadership as per the adoc that is adocracy so when adocracy comes in the organizations will be very temporary the government will be changing every day so if today is a pandemic and tomorrow is an economic slowdown so prime ministers change for today and tomorrow that is how we have seen in both the things warren benis said that in spite of systems theory having organic adaptive structures they will be temporary systems so i hope we have answered the demand of the question and warren benis characterized organizations as adocratic organizations and various phases of organization as per its leadership and in the conclusion we can say that system is not just affected by environmental constraint but also by organizational constraint so what we are speaking is organizational constraints and also the blend of both organization and ecological constraints so use it 
use Varan Venice leadership and adocracy in the future answers. Coming to next one, 2C. Productivity is not the result of working conditions, but the result of emotional response of workers to work performed. Are Elton Muir's findings relevant in contemporary organizations? See, Elton Mayo Arthur experiment, every one of us know. Elton Mayo's Arthur experiments. But delving too deep, Arthur experiment didn't provide this one. The emotional response towards their work. Of course, there was mass interview and all those things, but likingness or likability of their work was not given. However, this is taken from earlier studies of Elton Mayo, not Hawthorne experiment. And there he speaks about work performed. That is how we can conclude that UPSC is demanding in-depth knowledge of public administration is currently. So we by hearting any coaching institute notes and then dumping up in the exam hall is, is an outward crowd of friends nowadays. So you have to read the basic books like Prasad and Prasad, Mohit Bhattacharya, Fadi and Fadi, Rajini Goyal and all those things. And this question is directly taken from administrative thinkers by Prasad and Prasad. So we'll study the question and answer it in detail. The Elton Mayo's study. So we can bring in Hawthorne experiment to some extent here wherein his illumination experiment didn't give him any result there. So this experiment shows that the working conditions are not leading to productivity to that extent. So productivity is not the result of working conditions. Because Mayo in his Arthorne's illumination experiment found that the great elimination experiment didn't increase the productivity. But however, before Arthur experiment, he had conducted a study in a textile mill in Philadelphia, where his mule spinning workers were monitored. And how they were monitored? They were given physical rest from the fatigue. That is postural fatigue, thought process fatigue, emotional fatigue and all those things, they were given rest of 4 minutes a day, sorry 10 minutes in 4 times a day and bonus was given for those who work and who spin more mules at the given point of time. Earlier bonuses were given on the time basis that is who works for 3 hours he will be given 1 salary and 5 hours will be given 2 hours bonus. Now this is not the case. Within the 3 hours he has to provide 2 more mules. Only then he will be given the bonus. So the, by doing this he monitors whether workers they like to spin the mule or whether they want to take the bonus by just passing the time. Making the same 3 mules instead of 3 hours to 5 hours and taking the bonus or whether within the three hours they work faster and make five mules. And later the study was also adopted, adapted and some changes were made and the timings of the rest were decided after consulting the workers themselves. And all these three things, one is giving the rest, giving the opportunity for the workers to decide the rest and bonus for the speed of the work. All this re resulted in huge improvement in the company's turnover. And in this study, he quoted that productivity is not the result of working conditions, but the result of emotional response of the workers to the work performed. So here you can introduce this quote. And after 
explaining his quote and using these study as examples to support his argument we can come to the relevance of mayo yes people's response to work is relevant even today now rest to the people who work in software industries especially the postural fatigue we had seen at one point some 10 to 15 years ago there were a lot of eye defects and mental illness due to continuous watching of the computer monitors then came the lcd led screens and all so that was a relaxation to the postural fatigue a rest then every corporate they followed fatigue risk management system especially in the safety demanding jobs like the drivers pilots and others wherein if they are extremely fatigued it may result in huge accidents all this increased in the credibility of the company with a reduced number of mishaps then stress busting exercises are being conducted by almost all the mnc's and even the bonuses are being provided best example is shauji dolakia of gujarat a diamond merchant billionaire he provides a car as bonus to all the workers during diwali so he is famous for providing charitable bonuses likewise we can say that how mayo's study of response and interest in one's work is relevant even today and how various companies they try to stimulate and they try to keep up the interest in the work by providing bonuses by providing rests by providing other incentives just like the mayo provided in his study and in the conclusion we can say we can use simon's famous quote happy cows yield more milk so if you want to yield the more milk we have to keep the workers happy not just the working conditions their response their happiness to work all those things matter so one lesson we learn from this is we have to read the basic books as well not just the notes friends it is a very basic common sense that almost all the scholars they have written four to five books to speak in minimum some have written 10 to 12 books as well there are four to five books of herbert simon there are three to four books of f w riggs all of them and it's very difficult to represent them in two to three pages of notes and it always happens that one or two questions appear which are not there in the notes however they will be present in the textbooks because even upsc doesn't have access to the books they have written upsc takes questions from the basic books itself not from any coaching center notes so make sure that you read and revise from any coaching institute notes but at the same time you keep the basic books as a reference you refer them often again and again and have an in-depth knowledge regarding theory and practice of public administration they coming to next one performance information use is a form of organizational behavior that is influenced by individual job organizational and environmental factors critically analyzed so we have to provide arguments in favor of all these four individual job and environmental at the same time negate them negate all the four the critical part by that we'll answer the demand of the question effectively so we'll begin with what is performance information use so the performance information is the track record of every person the performance appraisal and they are used in the annual performance appraisal annual confidential reports in every organization both in government and private okay, coming to the body yes performance information use is a form of organizational behavior because in the individual perspective best example is delhi constable recently one constable she saved 14 abducted children and she got double promotion so such incident of hers or any other officers will be recorded under performance information and such works of courage 
going beyond the call of duty and jobs of intelligent breaking the breaking the toughest nuts all those things will be recorded under performance information and organization uses that information in order to decide the posting and promotion of a worker so in the individual perspective that behavioral system of using performance information influences individuals posting and promotion then coming to job so in strategic jobs like military then higher rank ceo levels etc the decision making ability of a worker then saving the costs that is having economically prudent policies then having maintaining the image of organization that is minimum mishap etc are been recorded and such performance of these workers are used in order to publicize their organization in order to maintain the credibility of their organization in order to provide the best work exam example is ravish kumar it happened like now in one meeting trump had spoken to modi regarding intervening in jnk controversy between india and pakistan and he went on to us and said modi has agreed for trump's intervention in indian pakistan and modi here said no i didn't say anything for that so there was a bit controversy and dispute like thing evolved two to three days it went on like arguments counter arguments statements counter statements from diplomatic offices of both us and india about at this man ravish kumar the spokesperson of ministry of external affairs he came to the media and said oh friends there is lot for us and india to move on so we shall forget these controversies and get back to the duty and by then the controversy was settled so that is how the performance of such workers will be monitored to give the best example the work of mr jay shankar well he was a consulate in us ambassador for india in us his work his meticulous job in us inspired modi and he was made the foreign minister later and now he is the foreign minister and that is how organization and jobs are also been influenced by the performance information use then organization private organizations that always stress on the performance information use so every person there will be a management information system a file for every person and their information will be stored p1 p2 p3 and annual reshuffling of organization occurs and these are taken out and studied and later whether to change him whether to retain him and all those things are decided so overall we can say that performance information use influences all the four there is an individual's posting and promotion credibility of the job so in some jobs in performance information use is used to the greatest extent basically in the government jobs and the organization and even in the environmental factors that is whether a person can be capable of handling the external factors like pandemic etc okay environment is missing here so we can add environmental angle saying like any person who has done a meticulous job in preventing organization from external stresses best example is rbi during the 2008 lockdown sorry 2008 economic slowdown so such things they are noted in the performance information and they are being used here rbi is an organization albeit any any person who, who was instrumental maybe the rbi governor himself he will be given either higher posting or promotion in in 
incentives gratuities or if he is the highest in the rank he will get a greater credibility publicity recognition rewards and all those things so in the yes part or in the positive part we can conclude that all these things are influenced by performance information use because merit system should prevail so the performer should get the highest post just like the polluter pays here the performance should be paid then coming to no part so in the individual perspective if the performance information use is an is a culture then nothing innovation done in the near future will be taken into consideration so best example is consider any repetitive jobs like there is no innovation occurred so far so all the workers they are placed under equal category under performance information use so here it can influence neither of the individuals best example is the government job upsc exams clerical jobs and other exams wherein there are 3 to 4 lakhs of applications and we get at least 6 to 5 to 6 thousands of persons having equal caliber that is their performance information is equal but there is only 1000 posts so in this case it is least that these performance will help them in any promotion so something else will work and even in the political parties there are many party workers who haven't done any innovative jobs and almost all are placed on the same line so now what happens the nepotism the nearest person one who is more in the limelight he will be chosen for the ministry so when there is nothing of innovation nothing of the the behavior of performance information will not come into picture while influencing an individual then coming to job behavior of performance information use is not influenced by job if the job is repetitive and riskless so once again here we can bring in various jobs here we are speaking about the individuals in those jobs and here we are bringing there is those jobs like constabulary even constables they have risks we'll leave it out there are jobs like you know in the automobile factory one man's work is to fit the chassis he comes in the morning he fits chassis every day another he comes and fits the nuts and bolts for this chassis so when all the 3 30 days in a the month they are doing only this work the repetitive job so what performance is assessed there so in jobs like repetitive in nature the program jobs perform behavior of performance information use will not influence the job anyone's job an organization government organizations that follow strict seniority based promotions they provide least importance to performance information use you can see the senior most will get into whether you have performed you are not performed is immaterial the environmental factors some fields with invention discovery etc they cannot be measured through performance of the past so if you have provided successful vaccination for sars there is nothing like you will provide successful vaccination for covid someone else will provide and this and this time the performance information of your past will be of least use because the situation is very dynamic in nature However, in the conclusion, we can say that however, performance information use is required for objective postings, promotions, fixation, fixation of pay scale, allocation work, etc. So, 
culture of piu it influences all the four to some extent but when jobs are repetitive when all the individuals are placed under one line and environment is very dynamic then organization follows strict seniority hierarchy in such pau will not be in use but however a futuristic recommendation is that there should be pau at least for these things promotion pay scale allocation of work all those things so to the best possible extent we have answered all the demands of the question next one 3b new public service emphasizes democracy and citizenship as a basis of public administration theory and practice elucidate so the citizen democratic citizenship component of nps should be studied in detail because this component is lacking in most of our notes a brief introduction to that so new public service drawing the steering by denhart and denhart so denhart and denhart proposed told three factors of nps that is democratic citizenship every citizen should be given a voice then model of community and civil society civil society should come and participate organizational humanism that is people should like to work for the people for others for the community it should work, like to work for organization and community so here we can see that new public service is not only government hand holding the public not only rowing them but the people should also have interest to participate in governance this is also nps so if we have knowledge of this perspective that is how people should also want to serve their community not just the government not just the part of a government to serve even people should have the duty to serve that component if we have then this question becomes easy the new public service emphasizes democracy and citizenship as the basic principle of public administration in theory and practice so democracy and citizenship can be explained very well so we'll begin with the very concept of democratic citizenship proposed by denhart and denhart that is how even people they are born to work our first thing npm as clients so unlike nps npm treated citizens as clients and customers that is if you pay you will be my citizen if you don't pay you will not be my citizen and public choice approach public as best users of goods and services in the market so there are goods and services to your budget you choose them if you don't have then stay hungry however sandal michael one of the nps thinker he came up with a book democracy's discontent and wherein he says citizens look beyond self centers to larger public interest so now comes the democracy and democratic citizenship they, they are not just the choosers of their own personal they know how best to choose for the community adopting a broader and long term perspective that requires the knowledge of a public affairs so this is also nps sense of belonging and a concern for the whole for the whole community a moral bond with the community whose fate is at stake so nps provides for democracy and citizenship as per sandel michael and even camilla stevers says that administration sh administrators should see citizens as citizens not as voters clients customers etc so even camilla stevers says that NPS emphasizes on democracy and citizenship not as clients and votership and Kamala Stewart says citizens should also share the authority and they should reduce the control of the government 
and lastly government should ensure not just efficiency but also the trust among the citizens so oh, to provide a brief of michael sandal sandal michael and camilla stewards camilla stewards friends she is a famous famous for feministic administration so you can take down her name for feminism in administration the one more branch of administration general michael says that people have an urge to serve in nps not just a, they demand the government to serve they have a willingness to serve from their part as well and kemla stewards says people should reduce the control of bureaucracy and democracy should take more powers and reduce the control of bureaucracy so in both the ways democracy and citizenship is being emphasized and coming to the practice you have finished the theory coming to the practice engagement of ngos public volunteers civil society organizations like mkss amnesty international fadf interpol these are all public participating in the with the government to serve the public so democracy public having a voice citizenship citizens having a voice and nps them in turn serving the public so we have answered all the demands of the question here the best possible extent even you think on these lines if you get any new thinkers new ideas you can take note of them and improvise this coming to the next one accountability under new public management has undergone a radical change although the focus has continued to remain on management comment so the accountability part of new public management has to be dealt in detail if you have the knowledge of accountable perspective of npm you will do it so prima facie npm we know that npm is managerialism client orientation timely service delivery and less of serving the public all those things but what does npm deals with respect to accountability that has to be taken to consideration so accountability has changed a lot although the focus is on management so nps sorry npm focuses on management but it has brought a considerable change in accountability we have two to three npm scholars here and let's see how they speak of npm and accountability claire hughes to introduce this answer we'll go with the claire hughes himself in the traditional approach of accountability politicians and civil servants are liable to elected authorities but in this approach but in npm they should be liable to people that is client the client orientation of npm is where in accountability comes in therefore in npm there is a shift of accountability from political to managerial sphere and from input to output and outcomes so not just legal accountability performance accountability not just service provider satisfaction but customer satisfaction so one may feel that we have provided the best MC, apmc loss but apmcs are not working at the same time next government says apmcs are not working we will come up with a contract forming and they think we have provided the best policy for contract forming but all of all the farmers are in the streets so who satisfaction government satisfaction no npm for consumer satisfaction accountability should be as per the terms and conditions of the public as per the terms and conditions of the output of a project coming to hiromi yamamoto he also spoke about accountable perspectives of new public management and he said that new public management doesn't emphasize on process but on efficiency 
that is inputs to outputs as per Claire Hughes he speaks about process and efficiency the reason for this is in the process or input it is difficult to calculate the efficiency of public service and controls according to which public funds are spent so whether the public services they are providing enough comfortability convenience to the people that can't be accessed in the input control on the other hand accountability of output is specified clearly by targets success indicators criteria for performance management etc best example is the portion of yarn wherein how many schemes you have launched how much money you have spent all those things doesn't matter it only matters is whether the mmr imr are being reduced so your budget saying that government of india has spent 35000 crores for mg narega this is input accountability india is still below 150 in the human development index in spite of getting daily wages this is output accountability npm speaks about output accountability coming to sarva shiksha abhiyan government has spent 20000 crores and it has constructed 2 2.5 crore schools 3 3.5 crore angarwadi centers all things doesn't matter whether a first st- fifth standard student can he read a first standard textbook can he do simple subtraction addition can a fifth standard student do two digit division these are output output accountability government of india has spent xy crores on ayushman bharat whether the critically ill patients are getting timely treatment output accountability so likewise not only the legal financial but also the customer satisfaction the futuristic performance of the quality of life all those things matter in process accountability then coming to lastly use of habibi and others they came up with five types of accountability in npm financial accountability example for cag activism cag whether you have undergoing corruption or not but there is huge loss in 2g spectrum so the loss matters whether you have taken bribe or not it's immaterial for me there is ethical auditing there is financial accountability account auditing from the perspective of the nation nationalism people etc operational accountability predetermined targets as we spoke in sarva shiksha abhiyan and all those things then public accountability social audits society comes and sees whether mid day meal is tasty whether mid day meal is nutritious and all those things politic politico social accountability so every law should be having social impact assessment whether cia bill is having an impact of impact on peace of the society corporate accountability corporate social responsibility environment impact assessment prompt payment of taxes all those things and on the side of government ease of doing business predictable tax loss i think so npm in spite of having managerial perspective in spite of treating citizens as customers voters etc it has brought a huge changes in accountability so you can you need not bring all these things into answer your answer will be like this so npm brings on managerial perspective like 
timely ser- delivery of services client orientation computation market decision making all those things at the same time it has brought in accountability like claire hughes input and output accountability yamamoto's process and efficiency use of obbs five types of accountability lastly accountability of the customer then accountability of the service provider sorry satisfaction of the service provider likewise you can answer so we have provided good number of scholars here make make note of these under npm coming to 4a administrative development in developments in the field of administrative law reflect an increasingly blurred boundary between the state and society and between justice and administration as administrative law become more constitutional than constitutional constitution itself argue so administrative law is becoming more a law in itself comment this is how the answer reduces to but however we have to provide how it is blurring the boundary of state and society and justice and administration so government society administrative law judiciary bureaucracy administrative law and at the last administrative law the law in itself three demands of this question so how it is bridging the state and society in judicious justice and administration bureaucracy and are they becoming con- law in them constitutional in themselves three different things though the question is framed in single sense statements there are these are three different demands and there cannot be interlinkages and it's difficult to link them within the 3 to 4 pages given by upsc so better that we take that as three separate demands and answer them separately administrative law anything done or going to be done by administration survivor jennings code we can introduce with this and coming to citizen and state how it is blurring the boundary between citizen and state so administrative law is helping the state to perform last mile and last man connectivity that is welfare schemes new economic policy new education policy national health policy and all those things so last mile connectivity then administrative laws are more stringent for administrative officials so there is lot of difference between uniform civil code and code of conduct for civil services code of conduct of civil service says should not indulge in government biddings should not attend late night parties should not receive expensive gifts or those things uniform civil code says only your marriage should be ethical you should provide equal importance to both bride and the bridegroom those things so the blurring of the status of a bureaucrat and a common man so commonizing the bureaucracy is taken care by code of conduct for civil services you treat common man with equal respect and common man should feel that bureaucrats are one among ourselves not a class among a class different class class among a class of different class most of judgments in administrative tribunal all over the world have been given in favor of civilians so once again blurring the state and citizen so state is already above to common citizen administrative laws administrative adjudication they give judgment in favor of citizens and they bring it down and equalize and they see they ensure that this gap this boundary is been removed the german wall is brought down between citizen and the state then reduce opacity between citizen and the state so regulations citizens charters all those things they reduce the information asymmetry they provide citizen 
the equal information which bureaucrats have. Likewise, administrative law is blurring the boundary between state and the society. Society is familiarizing itself with the state. Now coming to justice and administration. Increase in administrative tribunals. So in administrative tribunals, we know that bureaucrats are answerable more than the normal courts. Because here evidence act is not taken into consideration. Principle of natural justice is taken place. So whether a bureaucrat is doing is legal or not is immaterial. Whether it is reaching the public, whether it is justice in nature matters. The Fulton Committee, it triggered the concept of administrative adjudication, administrative tribunals. And now all over the world we have administrative tribunals. So we can begin Fulton Committee as earlier to maintain paper specificity. Then education and health policies are ensuring social justice. So administration is moving towards providing justice of political, social and economical to the people. Here you can bring in John, John Rawls justice theory or even distributive justice like reservation in education and all those things. Then financial justice by administration, how administrative laws are ensuring financial justice like GST rules, clear cut demarcation of how to pay and who to pay and easing of rules during pandemic situations like loan moratorium by RBI for COVID-19 that is also an administrative law and that is ensuring justice for the people who have been lacking of any income during the pandemics. Then ombudsman, grievance redressal. Both judicial and administrative have the representation in the ombudsman and even in the administrative tribunals. So in this argument it is not the blurring of boundary between justice and administration. It is justice joining hands with administration for the welfare of the people. This is one step above blurring of the boundary. This is collaboration, cooperation and coordination. And now with arbitration, mediation and reconcil reconciliation of administrative tribunals, justice is less expensive. So justice is becoming more near to citizens due to administrative laws or administrative judgments provided in the institutes of arbitration, mediation and conciliation. So the judgments provided here are not the judicial verdicts friends, they are administrative verdicts and they are administrative laws as well. So this is one perspective of administration we can inculcate while writing answers to administrative law that is judgments provided in the arbitration. They are delegated legislations or administrative laws per se. Then the last part, whether they have become being more constitutionalist than constitution themselves. No, they work only under the organic act or the parent law. Organic act is the act that provides for setting up an administrative institution. Example is RBA act is an organic act from where all the administrative laws of RBA originate. Then parent laws, GST act is a parent law and GST rules, they have to work in the compliance of GST act. That is how. So they are not constitutional themselves, they work only under the RNA act. And any loss of trust or any attempt to encroach into or negate this parent act can lead to judicial review. So other was amenable to judicial review saying that it is not a law by Supreme Court. So curbing administrative autonomy by legislature in themselves instead of are not waiting even to judiciary. Best example is in Nebraska one law was passed 
to prescribe the thickness of milk cans so there was lot of scams were going on in the sale of milks and administrative laws proved to be inefficient nebraska state assembly took in congress took in to cognizance the matter and it passed the law passed the rules itself so likewise if administrative laws they are going against the legislature or against the rule of law they can be struck down by either by the judiciary or by the legislature so there are no choices that they are becoming constitution themselves so constitution the law of the land the legislative organ is the supreme and administrative law they can only the supplements and you can conclude that administrative law is only a supplement they can't supplant the constitution they are only working under the law of the land so here we have an obligation to uphold the rule of law and law of the land so better not to provide any examples wherein administrative law is becoming extra powerful you can provide one or two points wherein they are taking more importance than law examples like manufacturing policies then un conventions indc of paris treaty all those things you can provide but in the end you can you have to provide in favor of constitution that is how we ethically end the answer coming to fourth b the content and process theories of motivation have same focus but are different in approaches do you agree give reasons friend here having two structure one sided in content theory second sided in process theory is the worst structure an upsc aspirant can do the question is not explain the two types of motivation principles or two theories of motivation so question is different it asks about the focus and approaches so here we have to in the in introduction part we have to explain what is content theory and what is process theory in brief but from then it has to be completely on focus and approach so how they are similar in focus and how they are different in their approaches so we will give we will delve into the answer content theory bring in abraham maslow frederick hertzberg clayton alderfer mcclelland process theory room skinner adam locke where we want provide their definitions etc coming to focus both of them content and process theory they focus on diverse personalities they say that no personality is equal to other they have different choices they have different preferences abrams need hierarchy theory abram maslow's provides for five set of people who have different set of choices and even goal setting theory rooms valence acceptance theory say that there are different valencies of different men there are different goals being set by different people so the diversity of motivation is being focused by both of them the focus is same then growth of an individual mature to mature from immature so immature to mature concept of model so they both mature to uh. immature to mature concept of model model then achievement reinforcing achievement the reinforcement theory all these things and even abram maslow says that satisfied needs are no longer motivators so when we go on the hierarchy of motivation the individual grows and that is being focused by both content and process theory so we have given one content theory and process theory as example here the reinforcement theory and immature and mature concept of model of uh, Douglas McGregor then goal what motivates the people 
for motivation there should be a fixed goal and that goal the concept of goal the focus that everyone should need a goal in their life is being focused is same in both content and process theory so what motivates the people content theory says for some self actualization and process theory says once balance to achieve that self actualization one's inner ability to set one's goals and all those things so concept of goal is same then post achievement happiness so once you are motivated you achieve and post motivation you are satisfied individuals you get rewards then you know from na maslow satisfied needs are no longer motivators so you will be at the bliss a state wherein you have no motivation in future so simply speaking both content theory and motivation theory they focus on diverse individuals there are many types of individuals then growth of individual in both the theory individual grows from step by step motivation 1 motivation 2 motivation 3 motivation 4 likewise he grows then everyone have a goal in their lives so a goal is a must in order to be motivated then post achievement after achieving the goal your level of satisfaction your level of actualization your level of bliss all these things are same so clubbing all those things there are many types of individuals and they are growing to achieve a goal and once all of them achieve the goal they will attain the utmost satisfaction the bliss coming to the approach part however the focus on the goal and happiness is same but approach to achieve that goal is different how ecological approach that is content theory proposes absoluteness of reaching the goal that is if you are having an instinct to achieve self actualization you will achieve self actualization at any cost but process theory says now it is only the probable self actualization involves various factors wherein you might get but and you might not get the so both the possibilities are there so the environmental factors so what are the factors like the competition feasibility and all those things will decide your goal whether you want to become prime minister of india just by thinking that you want to become prime minister of india is impossible there are many other players who want to become the prime minister and you will have to prove your mettle you will have to undergo the other stages starting from mla mp minister cm or any other post and all those things that is how the ecology matters then individualistic versus group approach content theories are mostly individualistic that is i want security i want food i want esteem so i am immature i am mature but however process theory says i am motivated when i am given equal respect compared to others so this others part group part equity theory a worker is motivated when he is treated equally when compared to others when he is given challenges and job that is equal to others that parity equity compatibility all those things matters in a group how others are treated matters for one being motivated so this approach is different
the group approach then coming to internal strength versus external motivation so it is not just others giving motivated or even myself getting motivated my strength whether i am capable also matters so a person who doesn't know to write even a sentence a person who hasn't completed his bachelor degree he can never become a civil servant no matter how much he is motivated after 20 25 years of age so inner strength also matters best example is goal setting theory our commitment to reach the goal our strength to reach the goal matters and in the conclusion we can say how content theory motivation is a single variable that is we getting motivated process theory there are multiple variables there are ecological approaches wherein ecology comes into picture that environmental and external circumstances individualistic and group approach how others are treated in our organization then inner strength our capability all those things are different so we can say that the content and process theories are same in focus focus of diverse individual growth and happiness focus of our environment our strength and position our position in the group so we have provided an apt answer to the best of our capability moving to next one 4c trust on citizen centricity and right based approach approaches aim to empower citizens in the right of the above as administrative accountability improved justify your argument so citizen centric administration right board right based approaches are a very familiar topics you can answer it. but the thing is that how to write a paper one answer so here there are tendencies to bring most of examples from paper two so my suggestion is that provide at least three to four examples from foreign provide at least two to three quotes so that paper specificity specificity is maintained so citizens charter you can provide quotes of john major or any administration is moi bhattacharya or any others come to citizen passive citizens to active beneficiary that is how citizen centric administration and right based approach they work you can also bring in gabriel almond and sedmi orba for the right based approach the concept of citizen king etc coming to how citizen centricity is improving administrative accountability best example citizen charter in uk passport office so the timely delivery of passports had increased after putting citizen charter that is they said that passport were deliver will be delivered on the same day from then on passports were given the same day earlier it used to take 2 to 3 weeks so that is how the uk passport office was held accountable by the citizens charter by the target provided by them citizens used to see the charter they used to demand passport on the same day and that is how the accountability improved improved the administrative efficiency then responsive government so how up holds jansun y and it disseminates information and hears the grievances of the public and if any officer is found to be delinquent he will be held responsible for his mishaps and that is how citizen centric administration the act of jansun y so friends this are not provided any law constitution etc this is a citizen centricity of administrationists or the government that prompts them to come up with these steps and come to social audit schools in palestine improved by social audit by the students students themselves were given opportunity to audit 
their schools and to suggest them any reforms in the complaint box so by that the quality of education in the school is improved after that even in many of indian schools we have complaint boxes though social audit is not provided it has to be provided so that students they inspect the account books of mid day meal ration the quality of education the attendance register of the teachers all those things the participative governance so allowing transparency international dags adr and other ngos in order to carry out researches in the field of corruption in the field of pendency of cases in the field of other democratic policies will also help in increasing the accountability so we have brought in good concept all these we can consider as paper 1 uk passport palestine internationalism indian examples so a balanced piece of argument coming to right based approach right based approach rti rts nota so usa only 4.7% of rejection of rti so the public information officer officers are very diligent in their work they receive every rti and they answer them with the utmost sense of reporting and being accountable to the citizens then rts madhya pradesh law provides training the citizens in citizens charter and social audits so they have a right to conduct social audits and hold the government accountable then right to recall we are in the stage of nota we have to move towards right to recall so this can be taken as a baby step towards a giant leap by doing this we will get a right based approach right to recall our representatives if they are found to be inefficient right to work unemployment allowance in mg narega if government fails to provide a job so if they have not providing the job you be accountable you be responsible for not providing you will be the responsible for making one family to be unemployed so you have an obligation to provide allowance that is how you hold accountability for lack of right to work for violation of right to work so that is how both right based approach and citizen centricity they are improving accountability in administration and in the conclusion accountability is not just sufficient we have to be aggressive we have to create deterrence so a study by rag rag is research and analysis group something like that so they say that 80% of the officials they started working diligently because of present of rti they fear that if any body applies for rti their jobs will be under see so they will work diligently thinking that they will not be caught hold off in future so that deterrence works a lot that is how citizen centricity and right based approach have improved accountability in administration and in the conclusion and not just accountability we have to create deterrence and we have to move towards one more step of accountability and good governance so coming to next one 5a comparative public administration started with more no paradigm of its own and developed none this is a critic of peter savage whom the quote of peter savage has been provided verbatim here so why peter savage stated this one explained in one or two or or two statements then coming to one critics of cpa you can bring in robert golombeski then han benli michael crozier watson milne and etc 
and say that actually compared to public administration had no paradigm and they didn't develop anything and golombovskis yes they set their own unreachable goals and failed then han van lee the cpi didn't provide any principles for the organization michael crozier how ecology impacts the organization was dealt how organization impacts the ecology was not dealt and there was no follow up to the fwr rix study unlike taylor who was followed by tablix henry gant charles lilian and weber by caroline hill reed and others so there were there were lot of post terrorism works and there was lot lot of post bureaucratic work even fayol we had gulikandar week just a bernard we have ratlas burger and others but fw rigs you didn't have any scholars who followed up his study so the chance or opportunity to form a paradigm was lost there and also the meritocratic fall of cag compared to administrative group also resulted in compared to public administration having no paradigm and having not created any paradigm as well however yes part no it has created a paradigm began with the knowledge of open system and contingency theory so after systems theory the open systems began and from this paradigm began the comparative public administration paradigm of ecology r k arora says cag made public administration broad based by assimilating hitherto neglected area of ecology so peter sevet says it didn't create a paradigm of its own r k arora says yes it created a paradigm of ecology then cpa was argued the most and cpa took the whole of the time in minobrook 3 conference cpa was hotly discussed there the very beginning of cpa can be said as one more paradigm of comparative public administration just like npa started with minobrook 1 npm with minobrook 2 cpa is the minobrook 3 so we cannot say that it didn't create any paradigm and it didn't start with any paradigm and then we can bring in robert dahl here it left a legacy of cross cultural national temporal subnational and supranational study of public administration so this is itself a paradigm this is itself a scope significance of comparative public administration so we have brought in good number of scholars here so friends one more thing in this question it is very difficult to bring in paper 2 so better we restrict to paper 1 coming to 5b markets hierarchies and networks represent modern governing structures in the government explain the so markets hierarchies and networks here this question is best suitable to bring in content from paper 2 provide for all the three markets hierarchies and networks we we'll bring begin with the dennis muller quote public choice approach is study of market decision making so in the market we have public private public private partnership in all of them whatever market decides polluter pay pays performer are paid user pays all those things competition hegemony anti hegemony predation anti predation everything comes under market so the modern governing structure includes all of them then hierarchies hierarchies of bureaucrats hierarchies of economy 
we have economy of us versus economy of uganda zaire congo we have a hierarchy of corporates we have multinational companies to msmes we have hierarchy of institutions parliament of india to gram sabha so governance includes hierarchies of various institutions both social political and economical then networks we can use john limbs quote governance is a strategies or strategies implications to build collaborative network so you can use this in network governance in somewhere else john limb so how is the network network of government private ngos eminent citizenry amartya sen jain drees paul krugman lokpal movement all those things a simple question you can write it with ease and get the maximum marks and in the end we can bring in conclusion like modern governance is a blend of classical behavioral ecological and systemic model of administration you can also bring in ethical as well so not so much of explanation is required for this 5c as policy analysis become a major source of legitimation of status quo in political and social order discuss so friends administrative law and public policy there are more number of questions so make sure that you provide equal importance to all the parts of the syllabus so analysis policy analysis is of two kinds analysis of the existing policy that is already working and analysis of the new policy so how such policy analysis is breeding status quo in political and social order so in the garb of policy analysis we are going towards a status quo society coming to the yes part as the question has to discuss we need to discuss both pros and cons of the argument so coming to yes part delay in the enactment and execution of policies so controversial bills are sent to parliamentary committees they say we are analyzing the policy they say policy is under consideration when they say all these things it means that policy is not coming to enactment in the near future so the name of policy analysis we are trying to shun away from rational policies radical decisions are not being implemented at the earliest incrementalism so in the name of policy analysis we are breeding incrementalism most of the policy experts they fear radical policies so experts on biometry in pds they say that biometry should not have been implemented in pds because there is no internet connection though in the jharkhand the death happened because of biometry mismatch all those things those are shun rational policies experts want to be incremental only step by step action taken policy and recommendation most of the policies under consideration from the past 3 to 4 decades in the indian parliament one of the examples that is you come up with any committee any recommendation they bite the dust for minimum 10 to 15 years minimum there are recommendations which are biting dust since independence and you file a petition in the court or even in the assembly about those and the reply is under consideration so that is how it happens the policy analysis is taken as a bait for breeding incrementalism to avoid risks in the rational policies bureaucracies they shun rational policies in the name of analyzing are doing research over those policies that is how it has been legitimating status status quo then however no policy paralysis is required for required before bringing radical policies so enough policy analysis should take should be taken up before bringing rational policies else policies will wreck havoc the society example farm bills and caa they had to be undergone with proper policy analysis before being launched the policy analyzers are the initiators of radical policies so experts we have said earlier that they breed incrementalism no actually 
good policies have come by the experts themselves not by the generalists best example is supreme court how it made the mid day meals compulsory and shanta kumar committee setting up of central vigilance commission and in the conclusion we can say we can bring in edzioni and dibo that is their textbook approach they said that textbook approach doesn't work in real times their quote change if not substantial only leads to tinkering it's not that we have to go as per the textbook we have to go to step by step that doesn't work some giant leaps some direct flights all those these are necessary for policy formulation so policy analysis should be stricken with a balance and it should not be used to delay the rational and good policies coming to 5d fiscal policy should address the issues of inequity intricacy and obscurantism explain the question on financial administration here once again you have tendencies to bring in paper 2 to the maximum at the same time bringing theoretical part bring in scholars and quotes of fiscal policy so that you strike a balance so fiscal policy should address the issues of inequity intricacy and obscurant inequity anyway you will you will answer it very well bring in welfare schemes provide in fiscal policy subsidies and all those things intricacy and obscurantism we will deal with coming to the introduction i am a fiscal policy is the use of government spending and taxation to influence the economy a simple definition we can use it in other answers as well inequity so i have brought in some international examples like obama care health care for poor people bowls of emilia educational fund for family or maybe the direct benefit transfer it was used mainly for education actually it was not intended to yes then pm garib kalyan yojana during covid 19 pandemic all these help in curbing inequity that is subsidizing distributive justice of john rawls then intricacy uh, robert chambers last man first as well coming to intricacy complexities that is how fiscal policy balances between inflation and economic growth how capital versus revenue expenditure political populism versus economic prudence you can bring in political and economic perspectives of robert smith and thomas lynch here the theoretical perspective to balance between paper 1 and paper 2 then obscurantism asymmetry of information how obscurantism is not opacity how fiscal policy curbs this detail announcement of the schemes better action taken report to the cigs audits this is the last year's audits then dissemination of dissemination of information and diversion of funds along with overall income and expenditure diversion of funds in the sense from one scheme to other scheme if fund was allocated to mg narega but it was used for covid 19 that will be stated in the fiscal policy diversion doesn't mean that they have embezzled all the money then overall income and expenditure all the things have been disseminated so that people have a knowledge of the past economic expenditure and the future allocation of the government so it is going to curb inequity all these complexities and intricacies and obscurantism and in the end we can quote fiscal policy aims in aims in bringing balance between equality of votes and inequality of notes this is a modified quote of one of the scholars so we need not use commas here just use it as a jargon so not so much of a difficult question next one 5e prevention of misconduct requires institutionalization of ethical values at the political and administrative level so misconduct institutionalization of ethics in politics and administration so how we will discuss beginning will the begin with the misconducts like racist policing in us the george floyd's death then senior IS of, ips officer eating a wife the video that went viral in madhya pradesh or rajasthan madhya pradesh i guess then head speeches by politicians so all these are misconducts so one demand 
and institutionalization of ethics at the political level how to institutionalize service orientation sense of nationalism impartiality uh, sacrifice for the nation how should we have code of it how to institutionalize this code of ethics for politicians intra party democracy while giving b form certificates strict action inside the party for hate speeches so disciplinary institution within the party so what happens if anybody comes up with controversies what political party says we distance from him we removed him from the primary membership only these two things happen there now he has to be punished he has to be banned for the next 10 years to ask party ticket such disciplinary action should be taken up then at the administrative level instilling moral values ethics ethos as per second arc how to bring in implement moral committee the training in objectivity honesty selflessness openness accountability integrity should be this is not accountability okay code of conduct we have code of ethics for politics code of conduct for civil servants they it's a detailed conduct not to take part in government actions not to receive expensive gifts okay to report to the government if any of the family members is having any contacts with the government all those detailed code of conduct are there that is how you institutionalize for the in the conclusion norms and values embedded in the constitution training in morality values psychology emotional intelligence work culture all these should be instilled by training awareness recognition of best examples there is ethical civil service aspirants ashok kemka durga shakti nagpal armstrong pame and others so that is how you institutionalize them institutionalize them in the sense make it either familiar or make it legitimate so not a tricky question you can answer it very well bring in ethics in administration that's it coming to 6a administrative ideas must be seen in the context of environment in which they develop in the light of the above statement examine the influence of new public management and information and communication technology and comparative study of administration so here first demand is how to view it in the environment which they develop second is how npm brought changes in cpa and how ict brought changes in cpa so three demands demands by to one ecology npm to cpa ict to ict to cpa three demands coming to introduction robert golombeski on cpa public administration is embedded in its political cultural settings he has given from four to five descriptions on cpa the first one is this so you can use it and how they develop in ec- ecology community management of assets in asian and african countries especially the community resource forest reserves and all those things commons maintained in india and african nations they were kadu kutu and, and other things okay they are, they are being studied by comparative administrative group they studied and they implemented them so they were seen in their perspective ecologies and japan's behavioral strategy to maintain law and order we know in japan after 60 years all the people they surrender their driving licenses to the government saying that they are not able to drive anymore but in india even after 70 to 80 years people drive their vehicles without driving license so that ecological perspective what is workable in japan may not be in 
in India. What is workable in Asia and Africa may not may, may not be workable in US and others. The next coming to the next demand NPM for CPA. Theory and practice we have divided into two. A uh, twenty mark question we need to explain a bit. Okay, theory Robert Jackson systematic study and deriving general hypothesis. The systematic study and general hypothesis. These are the managerial concepts. So managerial hypothesis like organization and method function, total quality management. Work study, work management, all these things are managerial. They are being taken from NPM. So, the systematic study of CPA was a contribution from new public management managerialism. Then, bazaar model replaced with the canteen model. So, canteen model wherein user pay rules the roast. In Bazaar, actually, it should be reverse. Replaced by so CPA says that in the developed or Transitia government, Bazaar are the customer or the citizens, they pay and use it. Kind of managerialism. And they should be provided with fuller satisfaction. However, in canteen, they are provided with the subsidized rates, so there is no need of satisfaction and all. Whatever they are given, they are doing with charity, and citizens should receive it with a shut mouth. That is all. You can bring in other any other arguments from theoretical part of NPM here. You can bring in Robert Golombowski. You can bring in Robert Dahl. Well, coming to practice, NPM began with Reaganism and Thatcherism, and when Reaganism and Thatcherism was seen, studied, and emulated by all, then became the comparative public administration. So NPA began with the Reaganism and Thatcherism. CPA began when nations all over the world started emulating it. Okay, OECD model of NPM in Europe was studied by all. The then developing countries outside Europe, OECD model of Europe is an NPM model, is a part of NPM model, and when that studied, that was studied, and became a part of grand theory under CPA, NPA contributed to CPA. Then, reinventing. And re-engineering model of David Hausman, Ted Gabler, Michael Hammer, and James Champy. So by re reinvention, right-sizing bureaucracy came a part of NPM, and that was implemented in other nations like New Zealand, which shut down seventy-two departments in one go. So that is how right-sizing, when it was compared, studied, and implemented, standardized, NPM gave boost to. CPA. So though we have two points in theory, we have three to four points in practice. Here also you can bring in you can bring in Robert Golombowski. That is there are both theory and applied part in in every administration. So very in the theory part we study others, and in the apply part we implement them. In this part we can bring in. So that is how where an examiner smarts try to be smarter, we try to be over smart him. Okay, then coming to ICT for compared to public administration, coming to theory. E governance helpful in avoiding policy selectivism where vacuum and overlapping of departments. So when one department was doing three to four jobs, better provide four systems. This one manager who is doing the job will be the manager, and he will coordinate to these four e-governance systems. So policy selectivism, vacuum overlapping, correct jurisdiction. 
so e governance helps in transition agraria to industria to transitia sorry from transitia to industria then ict also helps in better differentiation and integration of exogenic ideas so exogenic ideas we know hong kong was the first municipality to bring in a website an official website government website and that was emulated by all so in the theoretical part exogenic ideas like online application online bidding etc ensuring transparency and merit system thus helping the exogenic idea to be integrated into the society best example for this is how e governance of hong kong website studied and implemented all over the world so we have done it later okay then not required coming to apply practice part marakina model sms based alert for government schemes chatisgarh it implemented this sms based alert in its pds and it achieved major success that is how exogenic idea became into endogenic ict helping to communicate better and implement the administrative ideas then official website of hong kong we have discussed not of discussing it once again and in the conclusion npm and ict have given the ecology of knowledge and cpa gave the knowledge of ecology to the world so in good jargon we can use it so we have answered all the three demands of the question how to see in the ecological perspective how of npm to cpa ict to cpa in each part we have 6 6 12 15 15 arguments sufficient for a 20 mark question 6b affirmative action in socio economic development has not altogether eliminated discrimination discuss in the context of women empowerment so there are so various socio economic affirmative actions taking on but they haven't reached for men begin with arun mayra arun mayra scott assumption that socio economic development empowers the community on its own is romanticizing the myth yes just by taking affirmative action it is not that they have developed on their own best example un women's report 56% of women in the so called first world the developed world have faced discrimination on one kind of the other so even in the developed world socio economically developed world the discrimination is not eliminated next even the women in the top positions of executive and above ranks the ceo cmd etc receive less than half of the salary of their male counterparts a study by imf lg company they have said that they as less as 30 to 35% and some of the actresses like anushka sharma they have quoted like she got 30% of what amir khan got in pk and other things women in economically rich class in india are also equally malnourished anemic and suffer subjugation yes in the rich families the joint families and all there is equal subjugation even today women they take the meals after all the males are taken then me too me too movement is not just a discrimination it is one step above it is persecution of women in so called socio economically affirmative environment then not just socio economical coming to ethical to instill ethical and moral instincts among citizenry to treat women equally in all spheres of life so just socio economic factors will not help 
in reducing discrimination what we need is to instill ethicality that is from inner conscience one should try to respect and treat women equally so indian army is slowly providing more opportunities to women so that is ethical will not come in one day after supreme court after media after government of the day after experts when they comment continuously then army started changing its mind first army said women are not having same masculinity as men to work in army then it stated about the infrastructural lacune now it is going forward with the women recruitment so that is how it happens then cultural and behavioral modification as i said awareness campaigns rewards and in- incentives for the progressive work etc should be taken up so along with the socio economical ethical cultural behavioral and even legal actions should be taken up so not just affirmative some dissident actions so legal cannot be under affirmative so it bring in in others fines penalties disciplinary actions in case of discrimination should be taken up and in the end you can quote any of the feminist quotes like mary stone waldcraft simon de beauvoir one quote women are already strong world has to look out women are already strong so provide such quotes this one conclusion is assignment for you come to next one 6c a political reality is thwarted the move towards evidence based policy making critically examined so we have to provide both sides of argument as i said there are more questions regarding policy making friends now evidence based policy evidence based planning fact based analysis dissemination of information etc how they are part of meta policy making of ezekiel drawer ezekiel drawer actually it is ezekiel it is pronounced as ezekiel drawer provide it as a introduction and coming to body yes Pol- political realities are thwarted by evidence based policy making so that is in the garb of evidence based policy making the reality becomes the victim so time constraint and emergencies in such situations it is impossible to go for 100% evidence and facts best example national vaccine policy credibility of the vaccine the information is not being disseminated is being argued on the one hand but there is the need of urgent vaccination on the other hand the political reality has to take over the evidence and others so even many doctors have come up and come forward and they are taking vaccines the the facts is overpowered by the urgency then contrasting evidences when the evidences are contrasting the evidence based policy making takes a back seat in political realities it happens like apmcs in one state are good in other state they are bad apmcs in punjab and rajasthan are working very well but all over india they are not working so what government has to do regarding farm bills should they shun apmcs should they not shun so in this case evidence based policy policy making hits political reality then constituency pleasing us going out of paris peace treaty so trump had to please his constituency he didn't give any evidence that why he should go out of paris treaty why us is unable to meet the indcs and no proper reasons were given by britain for brexit was they want to please their constituency political reality demands constituency pleasing else they won't get what at this instant evidence based policy making takes a back seat 
then hyper critical environment that is demanded by the citizen for instant results this also results in unevidenced policy making so examples like death sentence for rapes then revoke of movies books etc so there is no evidence that just by providing death sentence rapes will reduce so evidence based policy making takes a back seat in case of hyper critical and instant result mongering environment okay then no there are improvised tools for evidence based decision making management information system is there to provide sufficient information decision support system is there operational research is there for optimization etc all the help in evidence based decision making even in the political exigencies and realities so that is how we can counter the above arguments and national and international policy experts like hdi human development index multi poverty index gender gap index corruption perception index etc they de demand evidence based decision making even in the political ground realities and they also help in evidence based decision making for all the governments they assess governments based on their current policies time constraint can be compensated by increasing number of players involve experts civil societies and ngos and improve the political power to have evidence based decision making then even organizations like prathams survey for education policy is an example wherein more number of players can result in more evidence based policy making in the policies like gst in india banning of weapon after church attack in new zealand then worldwide lockdown in the wake of covid-19 are all evidence based decisions even at the time of emergencies and exigencies so in the conclusion we can say that in spite of having immense political exigency or reality we have to follow the evidence based policy making else we will go back to john kingdon's anarchist model or our policy making will be akin to garbage can model so there is no predictability or stability in the policies so avoid that we have to make sure that we are having evidence based policy making coming to 7a globalization is impacting the context of national policy making the national policy agenda is becoming international explain so how globalization is make, impacting national policy our national policy is impacting internationalism so both national to global global to national we have to explain both the things okay coming to introduction globalization is not an option it is a fact obama barack obama scott so how some of the theories like game theory here national policy depends on international competitors so what whether india should join rcp rcp or not is dependent on whether china will dump goods or not okay india fear of dumping then india's non aligned movement non aligned policy of india doesn't hold water for today's world today's globalization because india is already major non nato ally of us india had signed treaty with ussr in 1990 1971 sorry even so national policies are influenced by global exigencies then there are common global problems which demand national policies to be in compliance with global conventions environment terrorism so national policy in compliance with paris treaty and other un conventions a convention ilo wto etc globalization comes with global vulnerabilities a quote by anna lind anna lind so policies of lockdown testing tracking vaccination all, all those things are the vulnerabilities created by globalization in india and we can bring in institutionalist model of public policy making here 
says that world is an institution. So agenda, streams and windows. All over the world they work in policy making. So the institution we can bring in United Nation as the world's institution for policy making. Richard Stillman. Organization also impacts ecology. Coming to the other part. Wherein national policies impacts international. So here Richard Stillman's quote. Organization also impacts ecology. It's not just ecology impacts organization and national policy can also impact global agendas. India's solar targets have now become international solar alliance. Then when in the course of international emulating international best practices, our national agendas become international. So Scandinavian countries started ombudsman for the first time and now it is a global phenomenon. Then some futuristic creative agendas like Japan's strict regime against non-proliferation treaty is a UN convention right now. That is how national policies are becoming global or international. And in the conclusion, globalization has turned the world into a company that searches for best, best policies, talents and resources all around the globe. It's a good jargon, we can use it for conclusion. So not a difficult question, you can answer it. Bring in policy making in global versus national, national versus global. global. So coming to 7th B, collaboration and its cognates for public policy delivery need to be viewed from governance lenses. Collaboration of various parties in public service so we speak in network governance here making of meaning of governance who is benefited and how rather than who provides them so governance is who gets matters rather than who gives And when who gets matters, whether private, whether government, whether NGO, gives is immaterial. Hence, a collaboration is necessary among all of them and their cognates of collaboration. Correlation, coordination, cooperation are necessary for governance. That is how we see the collaborations cognates through the governance lens. Here we explain how various parties they collaborate in providing good governance. Collaboration viewed in terms of governance in collaboration in policy formulation, collaboration in policy implementation and policy evaluation. Better collaboration for providing basic needs, last mile connectivity, last man connectivity by government and private first one. Public-private partnership, joint ventures, contracting out, etc. Government and NGOs, Akshay Patra, Medium Meal Scheme, then two or more governments, Sister City Campaign, then Japan Infrastructure Agency, funding Indian infrastructures, then collaboration among the community, the resident welfare agencies helping in police patrolling in the night, Diksha Scheme wherein Educated volunteers are being asked to teach in the government schools. Okay. So all the cooperation, collaboration and mutual coordination helps in proper policy formulation, implementation, last mile, last man connectivity and good governance in the last. So governance is a network rather than a single institution. It requires coordination, cooperation and collaboration of various stakeholders. So not so difficult question. You can give the best answer here. Coming to 7C. Administrative reform is an artificial inducement of administrative transformation against resistance. Gerald Kaiden. Seiden. Identity Identify the nature of resistance and inducements required to overcome it. So the thing is that administrative reforms induces an organization artificially to shun status quoism, 
ऑब्जोल्यूशंस एट्सेट्रा एंड हाउ टू ब्रिंग सच इंड्यूसमेंट्स हाउ टू इंप्रूव और मोटिवेट एन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन टू शन स्टेटस क्वाइजम एंड ऑब्जोल्यूशंस सो हियर वी हैव थ्री पार्ट्स दैट इज हाउ आर्टिफिशियल Inducement is done by administrative reforms and the resistance and the inducement. Coming to definition of administrative reforms, administrative reforms are the correction slips to transform the inherited administration. Rajini Kotari, this quote, and then coming to how the entropy, obsolescence, status quoism, risk avoidance are all haunting. and administration lack of experience expertise exposures for new reforms economic and social cost of new reforms that is how gst was shunned because of minor glitches in the gst network policy and administrative log jam if we implement administration like one nation one election so all these are the resistance that is given for given by the system towards a new reform so in spite of all these resistance we have to provide inducements so that organizations will transform inducement induction and periodic training recruitment criteria needs to be frequently updated so psycho psychiatric member in the interview panel for civil service exam group discussion in civil service exam and others so you can bring in n number of examples examples are left to you because not that a difficult question a direct question it shows that how entropy has to be reduced in an organization that's it then reward and recognition of individual initiatives taken up then google award scheme for civil service one example the so nadia district got this award some 2 to 3 years back then lateral entry lateral entry of senior managerial rank private officials into public you know very well about lateral entry then policy of golden handshake that is if a senior officer is not efficient in his work government convinces him to take voluntary retirement to take vrs so by all these inducements we are helping the administration to shun the resistance and transform so in, lastly incentivize research and development in the field of administration that is help indian institute of public administration american public administration aspa and other agencies to do researches in these areas so that more and more creative external even artificial that is which is not natural to the organization initiatives are brought in to transform the organization so whatever administrative reforms if they are rational they are artificial friends because naturally an organization tendency is to bog down so artificially we have to boost it we have to make it broader not a difficult question coming to 8a disruptive nature of development in information technology as change the contours of e governance in last one decade analyze so parent all e governance has disrupted and how it has changed simple question begin with the world bank's definition of e governance use of land warn ict etc for better utilization of resources in the last decade evolution from 2g to 4g from mere digital dissemination of information to performing legal operation interaction participation in policy making that is bidding online application etc 
earlier only websites were there now online exam online bidding online grievance redressal pragati sparrow other other things appear then managing information system to decision support system so informations provided in the in the form of charts smart graphs mind maps etc so that government can take better decisions that is media storage and retrieval in for mere storage and retrieval of information to information processing stochastic analysis big data analysis computer simulation etc then last mile connectivity has been improved earlier by 2010 or so people had to move to cyber cafes to get government services but by 2020 online delivery of services are available delhi government has come up with the law or act for online delivery of services there is certificate etc pan cards will be sent in mail e governance to m governance so we have shifted from e governance to mobile governance app based governance are being going on that is one of the major disruptions in ict aarogya setu app b map etc and financial management in banking has occurred a major distru- disruption in I- by ict so we have digital india digital currencies etc by this scams distortion of funds embezzlements opaqueness etc have also been removed both in banking and government financial management best example is jam trinity public finance management system pfs pfms operation clean money for track and trace of untaxed funds etc the last e governance should provide gati governance with accountability and transparency accountability transparency and innovation by naran modi had said this gati is a man of abbreviations is given this you can use this in answers so not a difficult question you can provide n number of points here 8b performance management framework enables a clear line of sight between planning measuring and monitoring performance critically analyze so we have to have clear knowledge on performance management division and result framework document these are already implemented in indian central secretariat so the question from there performance management division in every organization in indian cabinet secretariat we can introduce the question with the same introduction then now coming to planning strategic vision council plan key strategic drivers back end and front end service delivery so all these performance has to be Right, these are being taken from the performance management frameworks approach paper of Central Secretariat. So make sure that you memorize all these, take down all these keywords and memorize them. Then coming to measurement, internal auditing of finance, intelligence gathering on day-to-day works, performance of team members coordination between the teams etc then monitoring monitoring regarding validity of a scheme accuracy of a scheme whether it is reliable for long term whether timely delivery of services are there whether it is re- relevant in all the geographical areas and whether the policy is complete or whether any breakage of chain all those things so these are now basically a pseudo keywords that is if you have a memory of 10 to sorry 100 to 200 good keywords then you need not memorize all these things but if you memorize you will save time and resources in the exam hall so better to memorize all these in the performance management division so thing is that we have to plan better we have to measure whatever policy you are making and we have to monitor them that is but however the question has to critically analyze and we have to say that no 
there is no clear line of demarcation between planning measuring and monitoring of policies under performance management division that is there is no clarity of line of sight because some future emergencies cannot be planned so well tracking the performance management of any policies any glitches any mishaps that happens in the real time like pandemic disasters etc there's those cannot be planned and monitored and not all performance can be measured discreetly so any risks taken any person going beyond the call of the duty any army military officer we have seen during the kerala floods who is acting as a stepper for the people to climb on into the boats and actions that are not in the human capability any failure that occurs in spite of the officials putting maximum efforts then ethical puzzles like strike by farmers how to deal with them then evacuating the slums etc so all those things they cannot be measured discreetly so there is no line of sight proper line of sight line of sight is not separation friends line of sight is that if there are two points where there are no distraction the line of sight is clear here so this is line of sight when plan measurement of the plan and monitoring of the plan feedback when all of them they go smoothly there is line of sight best example you plan for sarva shiksha abhiyan for number of schools build them monitor them monitor the quality of education good result in pratham feedback so the normal policies the line of sight is very demarcated very clear but in case of covid-19 pandemic it is very difficult to say whether the lockdown was at the right time whether the lockdown was strictly followed whether government has achieved success in cutting the transmission chain planning is difficult no one has planned so far for lockdown and after planning monitoring monitoring the lockdown is difficult and measuring the government success is difficult so in the real time the all the three are not having the clear line of sight monitoring comes with cognitive and communicational barriers secrecy window dressing etc yes coming to demonetization wherein government says yes uh, 99% of amount we have recovered opposition says for 1% you have spent 12000 crores why spent 12000 crores you, you would have given this money to the poor people itself so government is not devolving complete information to the public at the same time public having other perception which government is not receiving so the barriers of communication they blur the line of sight between planning and measurement of policies Am- ambiguity in any one stage blurs the other three stages so in the contract farming farmers do not know how to form contracts this is blurring the whole law farm bill that is how it happens a, a simple question on policy making the thing is that the usage of keywords and how you provide the examples provide examples as we discussed right now provide sarva shiksha abhiyan for part 1 how all these 
strategic planning council plan then key strategic drivers are all set in the service shiksha abhiyan the back end and front end back end is the construction of schools front end in monitoring quality of education council plan how hrd C cbsc and crt all of them should sit and plan the strategic drivers nutrition education employability all those things and then come to here and pro take specific emergency cognitive and other examples and explain how the line of sight is not demarcating that's it in the conclusion performance management is needed for a planned and predicted development on robert weiner quote can use it very apt to the question so the demand of the questions are met critical analysis we have said how there is clear line of sight in one policy formulation however in some others where exigencies occur the line of sight is blurred coming to 8c objectives of performance budgeting include improving expenditure prioritization effectiveness and efficiency as performance budgeting worked effectively in government system so provide for the four keywords expenditure prioritization effectiveness and efficiency and how it has performance budgeting has helped them and lastly we argue whether performance budgeting is working effectively we will begin with the hoover commission which propounded for performance budgeting in 1949 then priority of expenditure every program in performance budgeting is divided into project programs and activities the least unit activity this is taken and every activities are taken and allocation for these every activities are discussed clearly so that there will be least wastage of money that is how expenditure is prioritized there then coming to efficiency cost based analysis and financial plans are done for every activity so cost benefit analysis whether we get benefit or cost and what is the more overall net cost or overall net benefit are being discussed so that is how even efficiency is being met so efficiency comes with the priority of expenditure and priority of expenditure the sense in sometimes we will have to expend more in order to get futuristic benefits like education health etc so both are interlinked coming to effectiveness effectiveness is the satisfaction of the society quality of life overall result so preparing the performance criteria for every activity in the budget so what performance it should be done the quality of education quality of health uh, quality and timely service delivery etc in the budget and actual performance how the quality is coming out how whether aishman bharat beneficiaries are comfortable whether timely claim of insurance is coming whether they are being made to wait in the government hospitals just because they are insurance holding people fund will not come immediately so we will delay them we will attend paid patients who will pay the bill and then come to the operation theaters so that is how and measure that performance with the actual performance and fine tune if needed so performance budgeting truly provides for prioritizing expenditure efficiency and effectiveness so now has it worked coming to an example we can take an example and explain national health mission as yes, hospitals doctors medicine insurances they are being done on a war footing efficiency number of hospitals have been constructed connectivity ambulances road connectivities are there then more number of medical colleges are being established under swasth suraksha yojana then publicity campaigns are being done and effectiveness reduction in imr mmr reduction out of pocket spending these is yet to be seen and after seeing this performance will be measured and in the conclusion there are more advanced systems like policy performing budgeting system ppb etc which are catering to efficiency effectiveness of the policies so these are the advanced versions of performance budgeting
now we can conclude saying that and we have finished all the questions coming to the last part friends i have been saying earlier give equal importance to every part of the syllabus and every keyword present in the syllabus friends so it is an ethical part of computation to fight equitably so even if you see the old question paper of upsc and feel that some chapters are been skipped some patterns of questions are same but you stick on to your ethics of computation and prepare well and who knows friends if you are more strict to your ethics than what upsc demands if you are very strict to your ethics and principles than what upsc demands definitely will go to a higher position than what upsc offers you you okay, keep it in mind so always fight ethically avoid shortcuts shortcuts always cut your life life short even though it's difficult follow the hard working path and study happily don't study hard all the best all the best for the friends